All right, we're here today to look at a very important chapter in the book of Revelation, and that is Revelation chapter 12. I am glad that you're with me today, tonight, and I hope and pray that you're being blessed by our study on the book of Revelation and the end times. And I titled this uh, series of messages, Living in the Last Days or Living in the End Times, and we talked a whole lot about in the previous um, um, chapters or really nights of study that you know we're living in the last days from the time Jesus was crucified and resurrected and ascended that started it all okay so we've been living in the last days now we're in those phases of the the, the times where the writers of the epistles uh, spoke of the, the fall, great falling away as well as during the book of Revelation we talk a whole lot about the church age and as it developed and unfolded. Okay, chapter one and one there was the declaration who was writing, you know, John was writing, who, who was instructing him to write, Jesus was instructing him to write, and uh, he told him uh, what to do, what you, what you have seen, what you're seeing, what you will see. And so that's what we're getting. And so this is a letter from Jesus uh, to the New Testament church and the world. And really, most of the world don't read the book of Revelation. If they do, they don't understand it. So it's really a letter to us. Uh, I call it a prophetic epistle, okay? And so we're grateful to be here tonight, and I'm grateful that we're able to go forth. And so I want to I just get started, okay? We're, we're up to really the half point, halfway point in the tribulation period. We, we've set a template uh, that there'll be, I believe, a calling away, a calling out, and you have to really completely ignore some passages to to not believe that and and i don't ignore those passages because as i said many times you've got to be able to look at the bible as a whole with a wide lens and every belief you have should fit in that whole bible in in, in a special fashion and so today we're at that point where uh the after the rapture has taken place and then there's been the first three and a half we've We've looked really at the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which primarily is the same guy riding four different horses. The Antichrist rides the white horse. And of course, on the white horse, he has a bow, but no arrows. He's peaceful at that time, but he's, he's been given the position to wear a crown. He's wearing crown, a crown, and he's riding a white horse, which, of course, is an image in itself. But he changes horses. He goes to a red horse. The red horse is the horse of war, so things begin to shift to war. Uh, with a red horse and then he goes to a black horse which is famine of course you have war you have famine and pestilence and hunger and so forth and then of course the pale horse the fourth horse is the pale horse which is death and hell or death and hades and so the abode of the dead so there's a lot of death and that kind of summarizes where we're headed and then things begin to unfold uh you know as we we're in chapter six there of course it, we unfolds and begin to unfold in the 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 vials that the um that the uh, Jesus, of course, the lamb that was slain, takes out of the hand of, of uh, not the vials, but the seals, uh, takes out of the hand of the, of the um, uh, one sitting on the throne, takes it out of the right hand of him that sits on the throne, and he uh, begins to open those seals. And when, as he does, things begin to happen. And that's what the four horses are all about. Horse number one, horse number two, horse number three, horse number four. But as he opens those seals, many things begin to happen. Earthquakes, famines, you know, pestilence. Uh, you know, stars falling from heaven, which might be nuclear bombs, and as John described them as best he could with his knowledge, and so forth. So uh, all this is happening on the planet. Of course, the Antichrist becomes more and more powerful with process of time. He makes a peace pact with the nation Israel for three and a half years. We're taught in the scriptures, but he breaks it, and this is where we are right now. We're we're three and a half uh, years in. Of course, in the process of that three and a half years, we have this, this scroll unveiled, seven seals in the scroll. And as he cracks each scroll and opens it further and further and further apart, of course, there's uh, more and more things happening on the earth. Then he moves to the trumpet judgments. And as the angel blows the horn, something happens. The angel blows the horn, something happens. You know, earthquakes, stars fall from heaven. You know, and we've got the, a third of the sea that's turned into blood, which kills all the fish. And uh, all the grass is burnt on the planet, so that kills everything that would eat it, and therefore there's no food, and, and you know, and so on and so on and so on. So we've got up to chapter 12. Now chapter 12 is is right at the end of the seven trumpets. So we've had seven seals open, 
with the when the scroll was unrolled. Now we've had seven trumpets blow. We're at the half point of the tribulation period. So prior to the half point, there's been somewhat of peace in the beginning with Israel by the Antichrist and the world leaders. They left Israel alone. And let me say this. Today, for example, there's this conflict constantly about the nation Israel. I wrote a book a few years ago called From Abraham to Armageddon. You can go online you know, uh, on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, and you can order that book. I can get you a copy, but you could order it cheaper, and I can get it for you and give it to you. And so, uh, but it's 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 a book. That I would encourage you, those of you who are read who are listening to this study, to get that book and read it. It will give you a tremendous amount of information about Israel. But as we think about Israel and the the, the issue of Israel, is, it, Israel's all over the Book of Revelation. Okay. And so that book really describes the beginning of time and how God created Israel and what he said then and what he said he'd do with them. And he has done it, what he said he would do in the future, and he's doing it. And so we're living in today in a world that everybody around Israel seems to be against Israel except the United States and, of course, Britain, uh, which in the Balfour Agreement back in uh, 1917 and then up to 47, they finally became a nation again pushed into position after World War II uh, by Britain or London or Great Britain and, of course, the United States. And so they've, become, they've been that nation now since 1947. And, of course, uh, when the United States blesses them, we're blessed. When the United States curses them, uh, our gas goes up, our interest rates go up, everything goes crazy in the United States. Watch that. But God made that promise. Now, so, But Israel is in the center of it all. And the Antichrist, of course, Israel's got to be back in his country in order for this to happen. So this, this couldn't even, Revel, Book of Revelation couldn't have unfolded the way it says it's going to unfold before 1947 because they weren't a nation again. And so God has grown that nation today. I've been to Israel five times, plan on going again next year. But today there's half, at least half of every Jew that's on the planet lives in Israel. Now, if you've been there lately, uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Israel wasn't that crowded, but now it's like Washington, D.C. at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when you try to get through some of these major cities in Israel. So, I mean, the place is swarming with people, all over the people from all over the world, but primarily Jewish people. For some reason, they're going home, and they want to be there. Now, they will have a peace pact for three and a half years with the Antichrist, with the world leader at the time, and he will break that in the middle Okay, I want to read chapter 12 because that's where we are. Now, I'm going to tell you what happens. He kind of breaks the action, calls time out, and we do a chapter 12. Now, chapter 12 is kind of a summary. And I want to read. It's only, thir it's only 17 verses, but it's a summary of the Bible's world history, really. And so as we look at chapter 12, I want you to understand what we're reading. I'm trying to break this down in simplicity for you as best we can with this book. And what we know from the rest of the Bible and what we studied for many, many years. And so what we see here is, you know, uh, God is unfolding the first half of the tribulation period. And then in chapter 13 on, he unfolds the next half of the seven years. Uh, and uh, But right now in chapter 12, it's kind of a breaking point, okay? One through 11, first half, we got seal judgments, trumpet judgments. Chapter 13 and through 19 is the, the vile judgments and the rest of the Antichrist, you know, cutting people's heads off and making them take the mark of the beast, which is what we're about to enter into, which will be next week. But right now he takes a pause. In chapter 12, he takes a pause and he does something very major. And so I want to read this, okay, 17 verses. So before we do that, I just want to pray. I want to pray for you. Father, you know that there's people watching today, tonight, this evening that uh, is interested or they wouldn't be taking their time to do this. I ask you, Father, to illuminate their mind. Lord, open up their mind. Open up their heart. Open up, Lord, Father, their understanding. Lord, give me the understanding to communicate with them. But when I can't communicate, I pray that you will communicate. Lord, I lift this before you for the reason we're doing this is so your people, number one, will be ready for the rapture and not want the rest of the world uh, to be in the this, rest of this wrath that's going to come afterwards. But secondly, we prepare our folks. We'll, we'll preach to our folks. We'll try to let them know what's coming. So, Lord Father, we'll fear and flee from the wrath to come. And so this is our goal. So help us today as we look at chapter 12. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and uh, 
and start chapter 12, verse 1. And there, stood, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars, a woman, a character, a woman, okay? Who is this woman? And she being with child cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. A dragon. These characters. A woman. Now a dragon. And, there, and, and, and his, and his uh, tail drew a third of the parts of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to deliver for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Who is the child? Who's the third? Who's the stars? See, these are we we need to identify these characters because these are symbols, which we'll talk about in a moment. And she brought forth a man child, who was the rule who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. Who is this man child? I think you know. Who's going to rule with the rod of iron? Jesus, the Lord of glory, is going to rule with the rod of iron. So everything centers around that. And her child was caught up into, unto God and to his throne. So, I mean, it, it kind of puts it all in one nutshell. She bursts the child and the child is up. Of course, it leaves out the fact this is the one who would rule the rod of iron. So we know it was Jesus. So, but it leaves out all the pieces of Jesus. You got the gospels for that. And so it summarizes it in one verse. This woman, who is Israel, of course, has a baby. And the devil's there to kill the baby. But in the process, God takes the baby up. Now, the baby, of course, gets killed and he is ascended. Under, but there's a whole other story. But he summarizes it. The woman, uh, this, this woman was brought forth a man-child. This man-child is to rule the world with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So it's Jesus. So it summarizes a whole lot of his whole life. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there for three and a half years, or uh, a, two, a thousand two hundred and three score days, which is three and a half years. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels had this big battle in heaven. And of course, the, Michael and his angels prevailed uh, and the, Michael and his angels prevailed because the dragon and his angels failed. Is verse 8, and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Now, this is when the devil gets kicked out of heaven. Okay? And the great dragon was cast out. The old serpent called the devel Satan, who which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman. Who's the woman? Israel, which brought forth the man-child. And the woman uh, and the woman were the woman were was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place which she is nourished for a time a time and a half time three and a half years from the face of the serpent she'd be protected and the serpent cast out of her his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, 
and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of her mouth. And of course, that's symbol of the, the flood is symbolic. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with a remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's 17 verses that are jam-packed, I promise you. Now, if we're look, as we're looking at this, we're looking, first of all, we, we need to identify these characters. We, if you read this after we get off the air here, if you'll go back and read these 17 verses, let's identify these characters. First of all, we're, we're talking about, um, um, of course, the woman, which is Israel, which is Israel. We're talking about the red dragon or the great dragon, which is, of course, Satan. And the ones that came out of heaven with him was the angels that fell with him, a third of them. And that's where we get the fact that a third of the angels followed Satan or followed Lucifer in rebellion against God. And they were cast down to the earth to do uh, havoc here to God's plan. And so uh, uh, that's we're identifying the characters. OK, the child that is born is the person of Jesus Christ. OK, and that's very important. So we're talking about Israel, the dragon, of course, the woman being Israel, the dragon being the devil. And of course, we got the, the angels involved. We got the war going on. But also, uh, of course, we've got, um, uh, we've got the man-child, Jesus, who will rule the world with a rod of iron. And so this is the characters, okay? You, you see that. Now, let's look at this, okay? Now, first of all, the theme of this whole chapter is conflict. The theme of this whole chapter is conflict. This kind of gives us an emphasis or gives us an understanding of the fact that God is... Um, you know, giving us a window to see the war that is taking place over God's plan. God has a redemption plan. It's been said that it took God six days to make the world. It's taken him, you know, 4,000 years to redeem the fallen man. You know, so uh, it's, 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 it's really a crazy thing. And in the last 2,000 years, we have been spent proclaiming the proclamation of the redemption of Jesus on the cross of Calvary and resurrection. And so really... It took God six days to make uh, man and everything that's in the world. And, of course, it didn't take but a minute for man to mess up, but it's taken 6,000 years really to get us where we are today, where we're understanding the plan of God and the conflict. And so chapter 12, there's 17 verses that summarizes the conflict of, of God and the devil that has been fighting for all this time. Now, uh, the forces of Satan, of course, are opposing not only God, but the people of God, whether they be the Jewish people of God, because anytime God puts his favor on somebody, the, the devil hates them. And so the people of God and now the redeemed of Jesus Christ, which is, of course, us. And so, uh, you know, this is kind of what we see here. Now, we, we, we know that this woman is Israel for various reasons, uh, no question about it. But oftentimes in the Old Testament, Israel is pictured as a woman. In Isaiah 54, 5 and Jeremiah chapter 3, you can read it for yourself. Uh, but this woman, of course, is travailing with child, which is the child of Jesus. This is not Mary. This is the nation Israel. This is symbolic of God birthing Jesus into the world through the nation of Israel. Okay? And, of course, um, uh, here Jesus will rule in chapter 19 of Revelation with a rod of iron. So we know those things are factual. The woman is Israel, the child is Jesus, and, of course, Satan, uh, the red dragon, is the devil. Okay? Now, in verse 9 there, as he talks about the great red dragon, or the great dragon was cast out of heaven, uh, this, is, uh, this is a big deal. Okay? Now, remember when Jesus talked about the, the devil being uh, a murderer? In John chapter 8, Jesus uh, talked about the devil. See, the, the Pharisees didn't believe in him. And he said, you're of your father, the devil. He's a liar. He's always been a liar. He's a murderer. You know, he's always into destruction. You know, I'm the man of life. He is the person of death. And so we, we know that he, is, he talked about uh, Satan being the, the murderer and the destroyer and so forth. Well, he did all that he could in the Old Testament uh, to, to, to sabotage Israel and to wipe out Israel and to get their nation out of the way, the word of God out of the way. I tell you the, the things that are important to to God, uh, his his word, not only what he says, how he wrote it down, how he you know given it, but keeping it, making sure it comes true, making sure we have copies of it, and 
And I can sit here and tell you, there's times in the, even the Old Testament where it almost the Old Testament almost disappeared. In the era of Manasseh, the king of, of the Judah, really, Manasseh tried his best to, to destroy the Word of God. He burned all the, all the copies of the, the scrolls. But one priest was moved to hide a copy of the scroll in the wall of Israel. I mean, God has always protected his word, but the devil's always trying to get rid of it. He wanted to get rid of the people of God and the word of God. And in our day to day, Jesus, Jesus' testimony that he came and died and resurrected and Jesus' people and their testifying. He does everything again to destroy and bring havoc to those things. And so as we look at this here, we're given a summary of his hate for Israel, his hate for the boy or the man child, and his desire to destroy it. So he spent all this time through the Old Testament as well as during the time of Jesus' life trying to kill, trying to destroy, trying to murder. And of course, all of Jesus' life, even when he was here on the planet, he was trying to get him to arrest him and, and, and mess him up he, because he didn't really know the plan. He didn't know the crucifixion plan. He didn't know the resurrection plan. Jesus didn't really inform him of that. And so he played along. So when he killed Jesus or had Jesus killed uh, at the crucifixion, he thought he'd won the battle. I mean, I've accomplished what I've been trying to accomplish ever since he was born. Well, what Jesus did is he resurrected from the grave and spit in his eye. And so uh, we know that. You know that. I know that. But the devil didn't know that. Okay? But here uh, we've, got, we've got him, of course, um, trying to kill the devil. Now, or tr devil trying to kill Christ. Now, in verse 6, he says, The woman child fled into the wilderness. So, she brought forth the, born ch the, the baby child, the boy child, uh, Christ, uh, and then she was caught up, he was caught up to heaven. So he, like I say, he summarized the life and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus there. But he went on to talk about the woman. The woman, Israel, was fled into the wilderness where she'd be uh, placed, uh, pre prepared, uh, have a place prepared of God. Now, Israel has fled in the wilderness before. After Israel, it fled into the wilderness because they were scattered all over the world, really. I mean, because they didn't accept Jesus as Savior. I mean, the Roman Empire came in in 70 AD and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed Israel and killed about 3 million Jews. And of course, the Jewish people had to scatter like a bunch of chickens all over the world. This is why even today they're in Europe. They're all over the world. They were driven out of their country. They had to run for their lives. And then, and of course, 1947, after World War II, after the Holocaust, after all that went down, they were brought back, and as they were brought back, they were given the opportunity to repopulate their country, and that's a hard thing. In those days, it's still a hard thing to conceive even today for the Palestinians and the people that have been there now for almost 2,000 years. And so um, Israel came back, Well, they, but they fled into the wilderness, into the wilderness to hide. They will do this again. I mean, this is, this is talking about in the future, but also in the past. Israel's had to run for their lives a couple of times, but this time will be during the tribulation period. And, of course, uh, he tells us this in Matthew uh, chapter 24 and verse 15. Remember back when we was in Matthew. So we're, we're, at verse, uh, we're at verse number 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, and she shall be fed there a thousand two hundred and three score days. She's fled in the past, but this is in the future. This is the declaration of during the time of the Antichrist. Because you got to remember, up to this point, she's had a peace pact with the Antichrist, and everything's been fine in Jerusalem. Uh, every other parts of the world have gone crazy, but in Jerusalem, she's been okay. But he's going. He's about to break that, and then they're going to have to flee. Now Jesus predicted this in Matthew 24, as he says. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Now, why do he say that? He's talking to Jews here. Now, during the tribulation period, there will come a time, and it'll be right in the middle, right at the end of three and a half, beginning of the last three and a half, the Antichrist will decide no more. Now, they've built a nice temple in Jerusalem. And they've been worshiping just like they did in the Old Testament, back to sacrificial worship and so forth for three and a half years. But I'm going to bring an end to that. So he'll step forward and he will decide, We're going, you'll worship me now. And so he will establish a statue of himself and put it in the, in the temple in Jerusalem. And when he does that, he said, this is a sign. Daniel talked about it. Daniel the prophet. Jesus is quoting Daniel. He said, when you hear this, when you see this, when this happens, he said, you need to leave Judea. You need to flee. 
He will flee into the wilderness like we're reading right here. And Israel will flee into the wilderness and, and hide for three and a half years. And so the, the ones uh, that are in Jerusalem that know what this is, and that's the reason he says there at the end of that phrase, he says, uh, you know, uh, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, which the abomination of desolation is a statue of the Antichrist, a physical statue of the person who is serving as the Antichrist, this human being. He said, when you see that, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, you and I are talking about it now, but let's say we're gone in the rapture. We're not going to be here to explain that. And so the Jews that are reading that, they're going to go back and they're going to be looking back at Jesus' words. The people who are reading it, he says to them, this is written to them, let them understand. And then he said, let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Get out of Judea. Run. Let him whosoever was on the housetop not come down to even take anything out of his house. This is not the rapture of the church. That's already done. This is the physical Jewish people living in Jerusalem, living in Judea, living in the area there where they're worshiping around the temple. When they put that, when the Antichrist breaks the peach back, puts an image of himself in the temple, three and a half years has passed. Let those who understand this go and hide. Go and hide. And he went on to say there, uh, let him uh, this on the housetop, don't even come down and get a change of clothes. You run and you run now. Neither let him which is in the field return back to the house. You run and you run now. You run and you run now. And woe unto them that are with child, them that give suck in those days. Those that are nursing babies. It's sad, but I can't change it. He's, he didn't say, you know, he's going to do anything about it. He said, those of you who are nursing babies in that day, it's going to be hard on you. He said, but pray that your flight be not in the winter. You know, pray that it just don't happen in the wintertime. Neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall great tribulation, such as was not sent beginning of time, and since the beginning of the world to, uh, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except for the shortening of the days, there shall be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. For those that I'm protecting, for those Jews, for those that are hiding, for those that will eventually be saved, I shorten the days just so they can make it through. He says, if any man shall say unto you, lo, here's Christ, you know, are there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, uh, inasmuch that if it were possible, they shall receive the very elect. You know, behold, I have told you, behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chamber, believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth, and, uh, cometh out of, uh, lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And whosoever, wheresoever the carcasses is, the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. A lot of death, a lot of death. And so when we read this here, he says, and there will be, there will, there's a, the woman uh, had to run and hide for three and a half years. Now, uh, this is uh, something that we, without question, uh, know is, is, is part of the future. We know that Israel will be, the Antichrist will come and, and kill the peace accord agreement, put up the statue. They got to go and hide. And, and, you know, as we see this, now remember, Satan has always been a murderer. And he's always done his very best to try to kill Israel. But they will be protected for three and a half years. Those who read this and understand. Now, the ones that don't run will probably be killed. The ones that don't run will probably be killed. But the verse, verse number um, 15 there, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Those that read and those who understand will go and hide. Where will they go? We believe they'll go to Jordan. We believe they'll go to Jordan uh, where we... Uh, where we go and visit even today as we go to Israel. And because, uh, I mean, that's, this, is, this is, you know, what we've studied in the Scripture. You don't have time to do it all, study it all, unfold it all, but we believe it'll be Jordan. And uh, they'll hide there in the cliffs and in the rocks. There's caves at Petra and in those rose-colored hills there where we go and visit when we go to Israel. Uh, there's a lot of these caves there. We believe they'll go hide there. We believe God will put a supernatural protection there. 
and even even in chapter 13, which we'll talk about next time, the very 144,000 preachers seemingly will protect them. They'll have power to protect them for a time. If you remember last week, we, we saw that the two prophets got killed in chapter 11, laid in the street three and a half days, and, and then they went up to heaven. But there's still 144,000 Jewish preachers on the planet, and they're empowered, or they'd already be dead. Okay, God's protecting them, or they'd already be dead. So we believe that these 144,000 will uh, protect these. They've been sealed by God. They're protected. They won't be harmed by the beasts of the earth or any of the things. I mean, God put a hedge of protection about them. And I want to say this. In chapter 25 of Matthew, and, and I want to explain a verse. You know, a lot of people try to use the verse, you know, uh, if whosoever endures to the end, the same shall be saved. But that's not, that's not there in that's not in that context. That's in the context of this Revelation study. He that endures to the end of the Revelation, the troubles, the day of trouble, those are the ones that will be saved because the Lord will come in the air. But in chapter 25, I want you to notice something. Verse 31, listen to this. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all his holy angels with him, then shall be he sit upon the throne of his glory. Now, this is not the rapture of the church. This is, this, this is the coming after the seven-year period. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want you to see something here. So the rapture of the church takes place. The seven-year tribulation starts. First three and a half, there's a peace accord, uh, but it's broken. We understand that. The Jews have to flee. Those that understand, flee. During that last three and a half years, they're protected. They're taken care of. 144,000 preachers taking care of them other people taking care of but watch this and this is make more sense to chapter 25 of the book of matthew than anything you've ever heard listen to this when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him chapter 25 of matthew verse 31 now in verse chapter 24 and 25 jesus gives this big picture of the end times and he tells in chapter 24 about the tribulation period and in chapter 25 he talks about the 10 virgins five have oil five don't the talents and all that kind of stuff. But when he gets to chapter uh, 25, verse 31, he's talking about a judgment. And he says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, when is that? That's at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. When is this? At the end of the seven years. And at the end of the seven years, before the thousand-year reign of Christ starts, okay? And so he said, he will separate them one from another. As she, a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand. Now, this is what he says. Now, watch this, because think of this in the context of the Jews fleeing, hiding in the rocks. Then shall the king say unto them on the right Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? Because I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous say unto him, Lord... When saw we thee hungry and fed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these my brethren, you've done it to me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left, Depart from me, you curse it into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this. During this time of seven-year trouble, the Jewish people, of course, are the target. The, the, two, pre, the two prophets that are prophesying, stop the rain, start the rain, turn the water into blood, and so on. Moses and Elijah, if, if it's them, which a lot of us believe it be them, doesn't matter. But one day, when they, when they finish their ministry and they're killed, and 144,000 are preaching, preaching, who are they preaching to? They're preaching to Jews. They're trying to bring the Jewish people to where they understand what is happening, what has happened, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Christ. There's not another one coming. They believe there's one coming, but he's not coming. He's already come, okay? 
And then these preachers are going to help them understand that. And so those that hear, those that believe, he says that there in, in that verse, whoever understands, chapter 24, those of you who understand when the, when the statue goes up in the temple, you better run. Now, who's that? The people who believe. Those that believe on Jesus. Those that have accepted the truth of the gospel. Those, those Jews that are now believing Jews uh, in the midst of this tribulation. So they run. Now, those that don't read it, those that don't study it, those that don't believe, they're going to stay in Jerusalem and they're going to get killed by the Antichrist. But those who flee, they'll flee to the, the, the other side of Jordan. They'll flee to the Jordan, place we call Jordan today, Petra probably, which is what we believe. And they'll hide. But there'll be people that will minister to them. That's what he's talking about here. I was hungry. And you gave me meat. When, does it, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, these are now saved Jews that have gotten saved during the tribulation period. They're the elect. And God has, you know, what I mean by elect is they've gotten saved. Now they're their special protected people. And they're, they understand. They understand that this is the Antichrist. This is the book of Revelation coming to life. This is what Jesus was talking about. So they leave Judea. They go across the river Jordan into Jordan, the country. They hide in the wilderness. Those who feed them, those who clothe, because they don't have nothing. He said, don't even come down to get another pair of britches. You know, you leave your clothes in the house. If you're in the field, don't even go back to the house. You run out of Judea. Get away from here because you time is an essence here. There's no time to waste. And so they flee to Jordan or wherever they go, we think it's Jordan, and they hide. But this is what makes sense of this. Now, a lot of people try to use this to say people got saved during the church age. This has nothing to do with the church age. This is during the tribulation period after the Antichrist has set up his statue in the temple, and, and now uh, the Jewish people are fleeing. And so he says, the, the, you know, then shall the king say to the ones on the right, I was you know, enter. He says, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why are they going to heaven? Because they're believing Jews, but also non-believing Jews, uh, as, uh, I mean, believing non-Jews, believing non-Jews. Why? Because they minister to these believing Jews. How do you show your faith? How do you believe on Jesus? How do you pro proclaim that you are a born again child of God? By your actions. Faith put into works. And so the Jews believed, therefore they left Jerusalem because they believed and they understood. And now the people around them in Jordan, a lot of them Muslims, because I've been to Jordan, Muslims everywhere. A lot of these now, they're ministering to these Jews. Why? They've heard the two preachers, prophets. They've seen them on the teletrons and on television and on the internet raise up out of the dust and go back to heaven after three and a half days. They've seen all that. They've heard the 144,000 preachers preaching on TV and on satellite. They've heard the message. They've explained about Jesus. These people that now are around the Jews are ministering to them. He said, you can come into heaven now. Why? Because you ministered to my brethren. And it showed your faith. You understand what I'm saying? But those who didn't, not, not so. Then shall he say to them on the left, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You know, prepared for the, really prepared for the devil and his angels. I mean, that's one of the things we get. It's the only time in the Bible that I know that this is, this is stated. I want you to go to the fire pit wasn't prepared for you, but that's where you're going. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? Because I was hungry and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't give me clothes. I was sick and you didn't visit me. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. You know, why? We, when did we see you? When, when you did it not to the least of these, my brother, and you did it not to me. This is talking about this event right here. I believe with all my heart. And so the Jewish people are scattered. They run and hide. Now watch this. After this takes place, he said, they'll hide for three and a half years. The rest of the seven-year tribulation period where they'll be. Now, let me say this to those who believe that the church will go through the tribulation period. Listen to me. First of all, you know, we're not appointed to wrath. This is wrath. 
God's people are not appointed to rest, so we're told in the epistles. Uh, here, what happens, uh, the tribulation period, the first three and a half is bad, but it's nothing like the next one would be. God gave the preachers, and he gave the invitation to the Jews especially, but even the rest of the world. If you want to be saved, except Jesus is your Savior, here's the explanation of why it's true. And listen to me, listen to me. This is what's happening. And so obedience, they flee, fled. And then when they got to where they were going, the people around them that believed, they began to minister to them and prove their belief in the Lord and trust in the Lord. Now, that's, that's just the way it was. That's the way it has been. That's the way it is. Jesus proclaimed it. Here it's proclaimed. And, and therefore, he will be in the wilderness three and a half years. So the rest of the three and a half years, he protects the believers. You hear what I'm saying? Now, a lot of the believers are killed for their faith. Don't get me wrong. But when they believed, he told them how to run. He told them how to hide. And even the people who minister to them, he, took, he, he ministered to them eternally. And so there's a blessing that came for those who believed and ran. And there's a blessing who came that believed and fed. You know what I'm saying? And so this is vital. This is vital. God, God squeezed out a whole lot of believers. A lot of them had to die for it. We've already talked about that. But these that believed hadn't died, and he protected them. And why does he protect them? Because the thousand-year reign of Christ is coming. And he wants them to be able to be the nucleus of human beings that will start a brand new thousand years of humans, marrying, giving in marriage, having children, and so forth during that thousand-year reign. And Jesus is going to rule the world with a rod of iron. And these guys will be able to be a part of it. And they'll be alive humans. They won't be angelic beings. They won't be, you know, beings like us who've gone up and come back down. They'll be real fleshly, heart-beating human beings. Okay? Now let's move on. All right, we're about halfway in to the tribulation period. You know that. And, and all of a sudden... There's a war in heaven. The devil gets kicked out, and all the angels get, his demons get kicked out. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, let's, let's look back at the book of Job. If you think about the book of Job, in the book of Job, uh, Satan is going into heaven and coming out of heaven, uh, accusing the brethren. Remember that? Job chapter 1 and 2. Well, we don't know when that stops until right here. I do know that Jesus made the statement that he's got to go to the cross because uh, Satan, the devil, must be cast down. He must be cast out. He says that. You can research that for yourself, but he makes that very clear. He's got to go to the cross because the devil's got to be cast out. Now, this that's where he buys the, the authority, I guess, to do this. But this is when it takes place, apparently, during the halfway during the tribulation period. Now, there's no way that Satan nor the angels can pester uh, Jesus or God or, you know, go into heaven and, and make any accusations because he's locked out. And, and that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So he says here, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And a great dragon was cast out and the old serpent and the devil, Satan, named all of his names. Uh, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now listen, today, while the church age is going on, the accuser of the brethren is accusing you before God. He's accusing me before God. He's accusing my heart about God. He's making railing accusations. God don't love you. God don't care about you. You're not important to God. But he's also in heaven. He goes in heaven. He's making railing, ac railing accusations against you. You know, they don't really love you. They don't really care about you. Look what they're doing wrong. I mean, he's constantly accusing. The accuser of our brethren will be cast down. They overcame, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. I mean, that's where the power is today. We overcome the devil by, number one, the blood of the Lamb. We didn't purchase his blood, we just claimed it. The blood of the Lamb. Secondly, 
They overcame the devil by the word of their testimony. If you are a born-again believer, you have a personal testimony that is yours. A personal testimony that is yours. And your testimony is powerful. And the devil hates your testimony. That's the reason he tries his best to keep you from giving it. Because it's individually unique. You have it. It's yours. It's nobody else's. It's yours. The time and place you met Jesus, the way you met Jesus, how you was transformed by Jesus, that is personally between you and God. That's yours. He said they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. But also he said they love not their lives unto the death. Now this word, the death here, is referencing you know, uh, separation from God. They refuse to be separated from God. And that's really what death is to God, is separation from Him. These people refuse to be separated from God. So as we look at this, Satan now is, 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 is cast down to the earth. He went on to say, therefore, rejoice you heavens. It's a big celebration going on in heaven. You that dwell on the earth, woe to you. Rejoice in heaven. Satan can't come back in here, but woe to you. Because he's down there. you got him full time now. Woe unto the heavens of the earth and the sea. And, and the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he, has, he knoweth but his time is but short. He has but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. Who's the woman? Israel. He persecuted the woman, uh, which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she would fly into the wilderness to the place where she is nourished, nourished for a time, a time, and a half time, three and a half years from the face of the serpent. Protection is given to her, but, she, but the devil wants to get to her. He wants to get to her. But she is protected by the wings of an eagle. Maybe that's the United States of America. Hey, I hope it is. I'm afraid we may not even be here, but I hope it is. But I do say... That as, as, um, as um, really the, the, the protection has been given to Israel by the wings of eagles before, we wasn't even around. Uh, and if you think about it, really, in, in uh, the scripture says, uh, let's see, I was looking for the passage of scripture on that. Yeah, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, that, e that Israel was delivered out of Egypt on the wings, on eagles' wings, on eagles' wings. And so Exodus 19, verse 4, that Israel was delivered out of Egypt on eagles' wings. And also in, uh, uh, in Deuteronomy 32, you know, he brought into the wilderness as a mother eagle would, would love her brood. And, you know, Jesus even said that as he stood and wept over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have loved you like a chicken does her brood. And gather under my wings, but you would not. He used a chicken. But uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 used an eagle, a mother eagle. And their return from Babylon, of course, came, and the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, that they would return from Babylon on eagles' wings. And today, for example, Israel is protected uh, by the eagles' wings of America. Now, just make that connection. That's astounding to me. And I don't think when they, when they uh, decided to make the American, uh, you know, animal, you know, uh, the, the, really the, the banner-flying animal really Teddy Roosevelt wanted to be a bear I mean he wanted a bear the bear to be our symbol of power but he was outvoted and uh, uh, he he got we, we ended up with the eagle and this may be why because America of course is the last uh, ones that are sticking with Israel probably before the rapture of the church takes place and I do say in my book the from Abraham to Armageddon that when you watch Israel you want to know what time it is on the prophecy chat on the prophecy line you watch Israel because Israel is the one. Now, when Satan is cast down, I'm telling you, he's, he's been after the Israel for years. Matter of fact, he's always caused the world to hate them. I mean, they've been hated ever since they were in Abraham's era. Uh, I mean, they've just been hated. And so at this time, it's going to be worse. But if you think about the anti-Semitic uh, persecution of the Jews, has just been astounding. And people would wonder, why in the world are these Jews hated so bad? They've always been hated. Why did Hitler hate him so bad? Why did Germany hate him so bad? But I'm going to tell you something. If you look, I've got a brand new book came out three weeks ago, really called Liberty Lost. You can go on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or even Walmart, I think, now, and you can get this book. I can, I can get you a copy, but you'd be, you can get it cheaper, and I can get it to you and ship it to you. But in this book, it tells you how many Jews were killed in Korea, for example. 
How many were killed in Soviet Union? How many was killed all over the world? Even the Americas, America didn't favor the Jews in the beginning. They eventually did. And God really swayed them. But they were hated. And they were hated. I'm talking about in the last hundred years. Prior to that, though, in the, in the in biblical writing days of the Old Testament, they were hated. I mean, they were hated. But it didn't stop. I mean, after we got beyond that, they were hated. During the Roman Empire era, they were hated. They scattered all over the world, and everywhere they go, they're hated. I went to Holland a few years ago, and they they are they have the, the richest area in Amsterdam, I'm told. And, and I asked them, well, how in the world they get to be the richest area? So they, they cut diamonds. See, they always find a way to get wealthy, no matter where they go. And you may not know it, but even before uh, World War II and the Holocaust era, you know, they turned everybody against the Jews in Germany, and they, and they arrested them, put them on train, sent them to the gas chamber, but they confiscated all their wealth. I mean, they had enormous wealth because the Jewish people can make money. They can make money, even today. I mean, they started the stock market. Most people don't know that, but the group of Jews started the stock market. There was a Jewish man that ended up uh, financing, uh, you know, uh, Columbus's journey uh, when he discovered America. I mean, there's a whole lot of things I can say about the Jews, but they've been hated. They've been hated all these years, and they're still hated. And during this era, they'll still be hated because the devil hates them. Why? Because God loves them. The devil hates you and me. Why? Because we're believers in God. We're his children. We're his bride. He hates the bride of Christ. And so this is what it's all about here. I mean, this is, this is just a picture of the battle, the war. Remember, we started to say, this, this chapter is all about conflict and all about the battle that's been going on all through the ages. And so here, the remnant of Jews are protected and Satan throws everything he can at him. He even symbolizes it as a water, as a flood. I mean, the devil throws everything at him. But the earth opens up and swallows the flood. I mean, just, it's, it just, they're just protected. You want to read a psalmist, what he has to say about it in Psalm chapter 124. I marked this chapter for this. He said, listen to this. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been for the Lord, who was on our side when men rose up against us? Then they had swallowed us up quickly when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters and the overwhelm, had overwhelmed us and streams had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us a prey to, to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. What's he talking about? The Israel. Israel. Hadn't been for God, they'd have been gone. God has always kept the remnant. God has always protected a host of them. And he always will. And even during this tribulation period here, he will protect them the last three and a half years. By this time, a lot of them have become believers. By this time, they're, they run because they're believers. And so this is a, a big issue, okay? So this is the middle of the tribulation period. The Jews will flee uh, into the place of ref refuge. Uh, most believe Edom, Moab, and Ammon, which is the declaration of the scripture uh, that, that tells us that, and uh, which is Jordan today. Uh, Jordan's made up of four areas. The, Mount, the Golan Mountains are... Uh, up in northern uh, um, Jordan, right across from uh, Tiberia uh, in Israel, uh, on the other side of the Jordan, on the other side of the Galilee Sea, uh, these, these mountains there. And then uh, Ammon, Jordan, and then Moabites, and then the Edomites, G-A-M-E, G-A-M-E. This, this is the Edomites, Moabites, and Ammonites, which is what we're talking about, Jordan. And so... Um, you know, they'll be protected there for three and a half years, and then will come great tribulation. Notice it. I mean, when this abomination desolation takes place, you get out of here because it's going to be awful. Jesus said that in Matthew 24 himself. It's going to be like nothing this world has ever encountered nor ever will encounter. This is the beginning of it all. What do we learn? What do we learn? There's dual wars, dual wars going on. Um, God is warring um, against the unbelieving world. 
through the tribulation period, trying to bring believers out of them. And Satan, through the beast, through the Antichrist, is making war with the saints as well, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, the time of this turmoil, the tragedy, uh, it will be no longer. Jesus says, time to wind this up. Remember we talked about that last week. But also it says, except for the shortening of the days, during this era there'll be a, a shortening of the days, there should no flesh be saved. You know, I went to uh, Antietam the other day and was listening to a man uh, uh, give the uh, battles and all that kind of stuff, and, and he, he was talking about a, guy, a soldier who wrote this at the end of the day. He said it was the longest day. Uh, we prayed for the sun to set. He said as long as there was sun up, uh, they could fight. People were dying. But when the sun went down, went dark, they had to stop fighting. He said, we prayed for the sun to set. It was the longest day. And so, you know, God will shorten the days. Why? It's because they'll stop killing. They'll stop. You can hide at night pretty good. He says, except for the shortening of the days, uh, even the elect wouldn't even been saved. I mean, there'd be so many deaths. The Satan, the accuser of the brethren, is cast out of heaven. Now he's down here on the earth doing what havoc he can do. Let us not be found uh, to accuse the brethren ourselves because we will do exactly what the devil does. That's something we learned here. And we must never be guilty of, of opposing the Jews. Don't let yourself get sucked into that. Listen, uh, I talk to Palestinians and I love them. They're nice to me. They're good to me. And they're good enough. But I can't help the fact that God gave the Jews their country back. I can't change that. I wish I could do something for them. I, I love the Palestinian people. When I go to Israel, a lot of times I meet them. They're guides, they're bus drivers or whatever. They told me a lot of the stories about their parents, their grandparents, and it's sad. But I can't change the facts of the Scripture. God has a plan, and they had to step outside to let that plan come to pass. And so it's kind of like the American Indians in America, really. I mean, uh, the American Indians got treated badly and they lost their country, but God has raised up a country of the United States of America that's really carried his gospel around the world. And so it's kind of the same way with Israel and the Palestinians. God has an ultimate purpose and he has fulfilled it. Well, listen, chapter 12 is a, is a turning point chapter. First uh, three and a half years is come and gone. And when we get to chapter 13, buddy, it's going to unfold and that Antichrist will get mean. He's going to get mean. First three and a half, he's pretty tame. He's going to get mean. Now he's chasing Jews. He's chasing Gentiles. He's chasing anybody that won't worship him. We'll pick that up next time. May God bless you and have a great day.